going back in time here in Lenore, North Carolina, with historian Bruce Craig and his fantastic collection of memorabilia and artifacts. Part 1 Welcome to Caldwell County Today. I'm John Hawkins, the director of the Caldwell Heritage Museum and your host for today's session. My guest today is Bruce Craig, who's back, I believe, for the third time with some of his memorabilia of early Lenore in Caldwell County. And Bruce, I understand on the previous uh, programs that you asked for people to call in and they have taken you at your word and they have called. Would you like to give us a little bit of information on what you've learned from the calls? Yes, sir, I would. Uh, I've had some real nice people. I've had a lot of phone calls. One that is very interesting was about the geyser on a postcard coming out of Blowing Rock on Lenore Turnpike Road. Uh, we thought the card was made up, but I had a, a lady to call me, and then I had a man, uh, his name was Carol Hagler. He was a construction worker in Lenore for many years. He's retired now, but he said he's seen that geyser more than one time. And uh, it, it actually started out as, you know, they were just building a culvert under the road and they kind of made this geyser accidentally. They piled the rocks up on the other side and the way they'd done it and the way the water went in, it created this geyser. So I don't know where this geyser is today, but you know, I guess they've changed the road, changed the water, but anyhow, it did exist. Uh, one other thing, we didn't know that Baton had a name uh, back when we had a postcard, I think it was dated 1907. Uh, but actually, the post office opened in Baton in 1884. It was run by Mrs. Smith, and her husband would pick up the mail from Granite Falls and bring it over to Baton, and she would stamp it, and they would either deliver it or people had to pick it up. So she was the postmaster from 84 to 94 when she passed away, and then I understand her husband took it over and kept it for a while, and then, yeah, I don't know when it went out, but you know, uh, it was down in Baton, a little ways up from where uh, Mountain Grove Baptist Church is right now, was where it existed at. There are a lot of Smiths out in the Baton section, so perhaps some of them can shed a little bit more light on who this Mrs. Smith was and who her husband was, and maybe even some more information about the post office as well. And I'm sure you still want them to call in with any additional information that they have. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, what did you bring today, Bruce, for us to look at? Well, we're going to start off with a, a real interesting thing, or, you know, I think it is. It's one of the best things I've ever seen. Uh, we have a picture, and this picture, when I first got it, I thought it was the same girl, one smiling and one frowning. But I found out later by some people up in uh, Collinsville up there that this is known as the Grisette Twins. Now... Their father was Julius Grisette, and the wife was Mary Jane Clark. Uh, and this thing, this actual picture was taken, and according to the date on the back of it, was July the 7th of 1923. And uh, it is talking about Lenore Mills. One is smiling, said she did use flour from Lenore Mills, and the other one is frowning, said she didn't. So I, I think that's pretty interesting. These kids, there were like seven or eight of these kids. Uh, one was a Hattie Pearl, a Julius Alford, Clingman Frank, Vivian, Ulysses, Ulysses, I think it is. And the twins are Razzie and Bessie. And uh, matter of fact, one of these girls was still living in Hickory up until just a short amount of time back and she passed away. We were trying to get a hold of one of them, you know, to, you know, try to get more information about it. Uh, this mill was right in the middle of Collisville, and if you think about it, right now, it sits right beside the fire department. It's a big old two or three story wooden structure that had a, uh, a mill wheel on the back side of it. All right. The good part about this, and the interesting part, is that a lot of people don't realize that a lot of people around Lenore had in inventions or patents. Uh, the way I understand it now, the Grisette, Julius, did invent and patent the self-rising flower. 
Not long ago, Bruce and I found out that not to be true. Self-rising flour was invented in Germany. Oh, so uh, it, this is his patent. And eventually he did sell this out and it came to the Lenore Mills, which is where the, old, where the Lenore Billing Supply is right now. And this was in the 1920s, you say, that the advertisement? Right. That advertisement was in 1923. Now, that's the, the date on the back of the picture. So, uh, you know, that pretty well tells us. Uh, <clears throat> and we do have uh, a couple of flour sacks that was saved from this business. Uh, this first one here is of uh, OK flour. It's enriched. This is a 25-pound uh, bag. Uh, the colors on this thing was, uh, is, is real, uh, they're just so colorful, you know, the way they put them out. And uh, so, uh, and it actually has instructions on there as to how to take the, the dye out of this so that it could be used for uh, slips, penny, petticoats, or, you know, different things that kids wore right. back in those days. Yes, a lot of people did use their sacks for clothing or, Absolutely. or items around the house where they needed cloth. Uh, kind of served double duty there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you ate the contents, and then you used the sack to make whatever you needed. Okay, and what's this one? Well, this one is the self-rising flour uh, sack and I believe this is a 50-pound uh, sack. Now, the self-rising, I guess they used the Wright Brothers plane and it rising up as a, you know, indication that this flower did rise. <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess they used their advertisement on their invention, you know. So, it was enriched, high-patent, self-rising flower. And, of course, anyone who's ever worked with flour knows that self-rising is one that doesn't have to have the baking soda and the yeast and so forth added. All right. What, do you have any idea what years uh, the Lenore Milling Company was in existence? Well, the way I understand it, uh, Mr. Grisette sold out in the early 30s. And I've got a name somewhere in some of my information as to who he sold it to. And uh, then eventually it was moved to Lenore, where Lenore Building Supply is. And then it went from there, when it went out of there, it went to Salisbury. And the way I understand it is still down there, but it is not associated with this name whatsoever. Uh, I do have a pamphlet that uh, is an early pamphlet, and it says Lenore Mills Incorporated, Lenore, North Carolina. And being using the self-rising flour, it has recipes in here about quick muffins and griddle cakes and egg rolls and hot biscuits. And one of the big questions at the top is says, why use baking powder? It costs more. <laughs> so uh, this is a pamphlet that was from Lenore Mills that we have. I'm sure there are cooks out there that would like to have copies of those recipes too. Yeah, because that's, that's they have standard one egg Kate. So, yeah. and I imagine the recipes would still work too. Yes, sir. Okay, the Mr. Grisette who uh, owned the milling company, uh, I believe, is the father of the Mr. Grisette who was an accountant here in town for a number of years. Isn't that right? That's the way I understand it because his uh, business was J. A. Grisette. I don't recall the initials, but I do know there was a Mr. Grisette who was an accountant. And so this guy was Julius Grisette. So, uh, and they, oh, matter of fact, the Julius Alfred, he was born July the 30th of 1919. Okay. And I understand he's still living and is in Hickory. Oh, okay. One of the interesting things about this advertisement is the saying that's on it, uh, the little poem. Uh, you can't put trouble or worry to rout with a frown or a scowl or a fretful pout. But the golden magic that will chase ill luck is a smile of courage, of undaunted pluck. So apparently they're moralized a little bit in their advertising too. Mm -hmm. And of course, too, as you pointed out, one little girl is frowning. One little girl is smiling. The smiling little girl says, we use Lenora Mills flour. The one who's frowning says, I wish we did. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, Bruce, looks like now we have some bottles here. Can you tell us anything about them? Well, these bottles uh, are real important to the history of Lenore because it's where, you know, a lot of things started in Lenore. Uh, these bottles are from Lenore Bottling Works. It's the first two that we're going to look at. And uh, now this is an information from older people in this town. There was two places that I have that it started out. One was exactly where we're sitting right now at the county office. There was a wooden structure there. That was my first information of where Lenore Bottling Works started. But then possibly in a building where the old uh, Chevrolet place used to be down here still on uh, West Avenue in a wooden structure down there. Then eventually they built a building and moved to the corner of Harper and Hospital Avenue. It's where the print shop is now. So that's where it wound up and finally eventually went out of business. Uh, this Lenore Bottling Works was owned by Avery Spencer and Rufus McGowan. They had a uh, driver of Lisha Barlow who drove the truck and delivered a lot of stuff, but so did Rufus McGowan. I think Avery Spencer was, you know, he helped bottle and do bookkeeping and money and stuff like that. Uh, their, Rufus McGowan's daughter, who is still living today, lives over in Kentwood. Her name is Margie Broach. And I've talked to her several times about this. We've tried to learn as much as we could. Uh, a lot of my information about this has come from uh, a man that lived across from it, who was Banks Haley. Uh, <laughs> He used to take his wagon as a small kid uptown when it was uptown and he would buy a bunch of these drinks and bring them down to his home there on the corner and he would sell them to people as they were riding horse and buggy out going to deliver stuff. <laughs> so he was a entrepreneur way back yonder. Uh, but I really appreciate Banks Haley and his information, you know, and he's really helped me on this. The way I understand it, there were somewhere at least eight different drinks that Lenore Bottling Works put out. Now, even though this is a cheer wine bottle, uh, it does say on the bottom, Lenore Bottling Works, and it says Lenore, North Carolina. The way I understand it, that this drink came out of, I believe it came out of Salisbury. And they brought it up here, and they were the ones just in this area, that the only ones doing this cheer wine. And uh, then I do have, I think I have four different bottles on Lenore Bottling Works. This is just two of them. Uh, the way I understand it, this one here had an orange drink in it, but it also had a cherry drink in it. And uh, so this is something that could have really stayed. But the way I understand it, they got sick and, or, or something happened and they gave it to Granite Bottling Works. And then uh, Granite Bottling Works kept it, and actually the bottles came out then. Instead of Lenore Bottling Works, it had Cheer Wine Bottling Works when it went to Granite. Then eventually they done away with that, and it just became all of Coca-Cola stuff, and the bottles were labeled as just Granite Falls or Hickory or whoever was bottling the Cheer Wine. Okay, you mentioned the uh, Mr. McGowan, the Mr. Spencer, and the Mr. Barlow. Uh, I'm drawing on some uh, genealogical research that I've done some years ago. I suspect all three of those men were related. I think all three of the uh, uh, men you mentioned had a connection to the Barlow family. Uh, some genealogy that I did on that kind of indicates that. So that may have been a, a kind of a family thing. And of course, Mr. McGowan was related to the McGowan hardware people that were uh, legendary in Lenore for a long time too. Uh, perhaps one of these days we can do something about uh, that group too. Yeah, uh, Rome, who was Romeus, I believe was his given name, and they they shortened it to Rome. Right. And he's the one that actually started the uh, McGowan Hardware up on North Main Street. Right. Mm -hmm. So that would be a good uh, topic there. With there, there were three of those brothers in that hardware, and all three worked for Lenore Hardware at one time. So and that. And they were known and respected by everyone in town as being fair and honest in their dealings and square dealers and uh, that type thing. Absolutely. Uh, the next bottles that we're going to be looking at is on 
Piedmont Bottling Works. Okay. The Piedmont Bottling Works, the only the information I can find is that it was located, if you think of where Caldwell Memorial Hospital is, it would have been about three doors down, or maybe four, in a big old house, and they done it out of the basement. And this was in the old Pete Lutz family. Uh, and basically, that's about the only information that I have on Piedmont Bottom Works, that it was associated with the old Pete Lutz family. But also, I received a book the other day uh, on uh, the businesses of Lenore, and it was 1914, and it did list Piedmont Bottling Works. But it also said, refer to Lenore Mills. So I went to Lenore Mills, and it referred back to Piedmont Bottling Works. So evidently, at one point in time, uh, the Lenore Mills was associated with the old Pete Lutz family. Okay, quite and, possible. Uh, you know, and we know that old Pete Lutz had a furniture store right on the corner up at West Avenue uh, connected with the mill up at Mortimer also uh, yes sir uh, so he was in they still some of that land up there in Mortimer is still in the Lutz family name. I see uh -huh. yeah so uh, all right so yeah Mr. Lutz was another entrepreneur so uh, oh, yeah. uh, he could very well have had his finger in uh, several businesses maybe even some that we don't know about he had a hosiery mill in Lenore and it was uh, not underneath his furniture store but beside the furniture store was known as the the Dixie home when it first started right it became Win Dixie later but underneath that thing was a hosiery mill and my mother worked there on the second shift back in 1944 and 45 okay I believe that store is located where Kimbrell's store is now isn't it right up the street from the, what used to be the Center Theater right on that same block as the Center Theater. Let's move, Bruce, from soft drinks to, uh, I guess, what we'd have to consider a more healthy drink, milk. And uh, you have, I believe, five bottles there and some information about various dairies that were in uh, Lenore and Caldwell County. Well, I think one of the, the biggest in, uh, that, we hear, that I hear so much about was the Presnell Dairy. Uh, this dairy was located on Highway 90, which is the Taylorsville Road. Uh, it existed for a lot of years. This is the Presnell home place off Highway 90 on the old dairy farm. This, of course, is a recent photo, but it is still in existence today. And uh, they did sell milk in the milk bottles, but they also sold the milk to the Caldwell Creamery. Uh, which is located up, which was located uptown. Uh, the Caldwell Creamery was a place that did not milk cows, but they just brought milk in and they bottled it and sold it and delivered it around town. And uh, that business existed for a pretty good while. It was one of the, it was the first one. It was down on West Avenue. Eventually became Coble Dairy. And then when Coble Dairy went out, it became uh, Major Bentley's roofing place down okay. there. So that's where that's located. Uh, I think it's unique about these bottles, the way they printed them up. And if you'll notice that these, these two people, Caldwell Creamery and the Presnell Dairy, were related to a certain extent. So they used the same insignia on the back with the little baby being very happy uh, about getting pasteurized for safety. <laughs> And so pasteurization of milk was back in the early days. Bruce, do you have any idea of the years we're talking about here? Uh, yeah, the, the Caldwell Creamery was in the late teens. Okay. And then went from there, and Coble Dairy took it over in somewhere in the late 30s. I uh, see. And then I'm not sure when they went out. All right. And uh, I'm not sure when Preston Dairy went out, but it was there. Preston Dairy was there for a long time on right. Highway 90. Uh, this next one is, is real close to downtown Lenore. The house still exists today. Uh, it was known as the Rab House. It's out on Harper Avenue. This is a recent photo of the Rab home, and WJRI Radio at one time was on this property. 
there's a surveying place. I believe that's Western Carolina Survey. Ty Bishop, I believe, has yes. that now. He has that house now. Uh, but this was known as Mary's Grove Dairy. Uh, I've got an uncle, Albert Holman, who worked for these people for a while as a young boy. Uh, and, you know, if you notice, a lot of times, this bottle right here, it's Mary's Grove Dairy, but it, has, it had two phone numbers, phone number 93 and 57. So, you know, you could call in your orders, and they would deliver it to your house. So uh, Mary's Grove existed for quite a bit of while, you know, and uh, I know when the young rab boy finally sold the house here, what, two years ago, three years Something ago? Something like that, yes. And uh, that's when Ty Bishop wound up with the house. And uh, everything changes, you know, as, as we go on in life. I remember there used to be a large barn out there, and I suppose that, uh, did they have their own cows there? Or? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I suppose that's the reason for the barn then. Yeah, they had a they owned a lot of acreage out there at one right. time. Of course, Mary's Grove, you know, was the ancestral home of Parson John Stone Miller, who was the founder of the Episcopal Church in Lenore too. And mm -hmm. Parson Miller has quite a few descendants still here in the town. Absolutely, yeah. This next bottle is uh, Triplets Dairy. Uh, Triplets Dairy was where the Brawl Hill main office sits right now. Uh, I can remember on the road up there looking down at this dairy uh, as a, you know, teenager. Uh, matter of fact, I went to school with uh, Ralph Presswood, who his mother and father were running that dairy at that time. And, uh, but that's where this was located. And uh, let's see, they have a phone number and it's 453R. You know, once they got so many phone numbers, they had to start adding letters right. to the end of it so they could extend their thing. But still, a lot of people had, you know, party lines. And I've talked to a lot of people that had four and five people on their party line. They'd pick it up and somebody would be talking. They'd have to wait till they got done, you know. Right. Uh, this next bottle is the Oakland Farms, which was located in Granite Falls. I'm not sure exactly where, uh, but I do know that there was a Granada Farms dairy down there, plus this one. And there were a couple of others around Lenore that I've never been able to find anything on. Uh, one was the J.C. Eller. Uh, the J.C. Eller dairy was out on North Main Street. The old farmhouse that sits up on a hill off of Creekway Drive, you can look up there and see it. The house still stands. The barn used to sit, as you come up North Main Street, right before you get to the old hosiery mill and the railroad tracks, there was a barn on the right there in the holler. Okay. And matter of fact, when it closed down, old Pete Lutzler used that barn to store used radios in that he would trade in his furniture business. So there was the J.C. Eller, then there was a man that built a house on Harper Avenue. Can't remember his first name, but it was uh, Boyd. And he had a couple of sons. And the dairy was out just when you start into game on, on the left out there. And it was called Boyd's Dairy. Uh, there was a dairy in uh, all down on the Wilkesboro Road. And I, I can't think, I've got that name written down somewhere, but it's, it's not in this brain up here. My, if it was up there, I might not could bring it up anyway. <laughs> so, but it was at Cedar Rock is where it was at, where this dairy was located. So we had a lot of dairies. And a matter of fact, there was another one I just happened to think of, M.M. M. Pennell, who had a construction company right. in Lenore. He also had a, uh, a milling shop where he milled out uh, moldings and all that stuff. Plus he done construction, plus where Dick Pennell lives today, right. and that little place across from him there where he keeps his uh, bulldozers, that's where the M.M. M. Pennell Dairy was located, and they had all them fields out there for cows. Now I do know that they just produced the milk and sold it to other people. They did not deliver it. You know. I suppose, Bruce, that there are people who are listening who can uh, fill in some of these blanks that 
that you're drawing right at the moment, and I'm sure you'd still like to hear from them. Give them your oh, phone I, number again so they can call you. Oh, I, I would really appreciate it. Uh, it's 754-7330, and they can leave me a message or catch me by chance. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, needful to point out that neither Bruce nor I nor anyone else is the last word on anything in Caldwell County history. There are plenty of things uh, out there that neither of us know, and we're both eager to know uh, any part of the history, not just the dairies, but anything else. Uh, so uh, let it be known when you know a little bit of history. What you know may be the very link that we're needing uh, to tie something together. Yeah. One thing I'd like to make a point of is that I keep learning each time with these phone calls. That's the way I learned about the post office and the other things. But as many times as I had talked to Banks Haley, I knew that uh, there, were, there was one po two postcards actually that talked about the turnpike, Lenore Turnpike, and that was from the foot of the blow of, of the mountain to the, where you went into Blowing Rock. Well, at the foot of the mountain, there was a man, and I think his name was Scott, Mr. Scott, and he had a bar that would cross the road. When you came up to there, you had to pay a toll Right. And an automobile, the way Banks Haley told me, was around 20 cents to get on that road to go to Blowing Rock. Then when you turned to come back, you had to pay another man to come down the mountain. But okay. their job was they took the money from the toll and they had to keep the road passable for you. Right. And probably a horse and buggy might have been a little less than 20 cents. They figure if you had a car, it was worth 20 cents to take it up there. Right. I have seen some of those rates, too, but I've forgotten what they are. I don't know about a Mr. Scott. I know there was a Mr. Coffee who kept the uh, toll road for a while and a Ms. Barlow who did it for a while. Perhaps there was a Mr. Scott, too. I don't know. Uh, Again, that may be something that someone has the information that we'd love to have. Well, if, if we can just take some of this information and get a bunch of it and tie everything together, this is what makes the history of Lenore. If there's a missing link, a lot of times something gets lost or distorted. Right. And, uh, you know, so any information, uh, we would just really appreciate it, you know. Okay, speaking of information, uh, we have some information here that goes back 50 or more years. Uh, we have a couple of business directories and a couple of telephone directories uh, that uh, were in existence. Uh, you'll notice that the uh, uh, this is called the Lenore City Directory and it was published in 1957 and 58 and notice the advertisements uh, that are all over it um, and all over the covers. They, they used it a great deal but there was some ingenuity there too because if you'll notice here uh, Shields Hardware uh, purchased this and has it on the bottom, on the side, and on the top. Seem like a very uh, clever device to get some advertising in, but uh, uh, tell us about these, Bruce, and, and the type of information that they contain. Well, these actually go back to the earliest I've seen is a 1945 in a hardback. Okay. Now, this, they made two different versions. This one was a little more complete and listed a little more different things, but they all did so done a condensed version in a paperback. Uh, now, this was by the Miller Company. Now, this book here was actually printed in 41 or 42, 41 through 42. So there might be a hardback out there. What these books listed was every business that was in Lenore, some in Caldwell County, but I think it was basically in Lenore, uh, the city of Lenore. And uh, what I like about them is it lists everybody that lived in Lenore. And most of the time it would say, like, John Hawkins, Vance Street, wife so-and-so, and two kids. And that's the information that they had. Sometimes they actually gave, like, uh, John Hawkins, and they would say, school teacher. Or like my father, who was Audie Craig, they would say, furniture worker. So it told where they worked or kind of what their occupation was. But these books have a world of information in them. Uh, a lot of businesses or people that we might not know about, they're listed in these books. And that's the reason I, I try my best to collect as many of these. I've got them, some 68s, some 63s, 
but you know, I do know that there's earlier ones that I don't have. So this is where some information that I have does come from. And then it has a listing for the businesses and uh, then I think there's a telephone section in there that gives everybody's telephone number. Uh, right, okay, and the, uh, right, the telephone numbers are not listed uh, with the personal information. Uh, the businesses are listed, here's Carolina Tire and Appliance, 207 East Harper Avenue. Home Electric Company of Lenore, 200 West Harper Avenue, both names that we remember from the, those days. Correct, yeah. Now, another source of information is when I can run across or find uh, phone books that are on Lenore. Now, these were handed out to all the people. The, the city directories, I think you had to pay for them. I think so, yes. And a lot of people did not purchase those, but, you know, because it cost money. But these phone books were handed out to everyone. And uh, this one is a 1949 and the other is a 1952. Now, if you think about in the old days when they had one, two, three digit phone numbers, that would have been in 1949 when they changed the phone system to go to four, five, six, seven, oh, or whatever the number might have been, was in 1952. That was the first year that they started with that number. Then in 58, they started putting the PL on the front of it, which it was called Plaza. Plaza, right. And then about 1963, 64, you started, you had to dial the whole number, 754. Right. So we've grown from one digits to five digits to eight digits, and now we've got a zip code and uh, area code, um, and, uh, and it's, the numbers are going to keep getting bigger and bigger. Okay, Bruce, for advertising purposes, lots of businesses produce different items that they handed out to their customers. So thermometer seems to be one of the things, and you've got quite a collection of those. Can you tell us about some of them? Yes, sir. Uh, a lot of these, what they've done, they would put this thermometer out, and it would more or less, people would take it home, hang it on their wall, but it would be an advertisement. And when they seen this, they would think of their business and maybe right. come and do business with them. And uh, I'm going to say that one of my earliest is of the Greer Funeral Home. Uh, this was located on West Avenue in a house down there. And uh, it was there for a lot of years. And uh, when it first started out, it had a phone number of nine. And uh, they ran the ambulance service, right? And they also uh, were undertakers. You know, they would bury people. And uh, then, Mr. Greer was very well known in town for many years. He hasn't been dead a great many years, but mm -hmm. uh, I remember him very, very well. Oh yes, he he was a big. Uh, a story about him. I can remember my grandfather died and I was real little, and, we, and my mother took me to see him. And they had half the casket open so you could see just from his waist right. up. Well, my sister and I had it made up that they cut his legs off. <laughs> so we, we were afraid to go in there. So we lived and we would walk by this place all the time, and my father got talking to Mr. Greer about this. And so he took us in one day and he showed us everything about how they'd done the caskets and they had only opened half of it, but all the people were in there. They didn't cut their legs off. <laughs> so that was at an early age that I really thought they'd done that. Uh, this right here is a thermometer and it's on the Bank of Lenore. Uh, the Bank of Lenore started in, what, 1884? Somewhere in the 1880s. Uh, it was located on uh, North Main Street, a well-known business. They had a, uh, done a lot of business. I've got a lot of uh, paper stuff that is on Lenore where they've, you know, wrote money and this and that and the other and checks and different things from that I've acquired from different people. But uh, this was the Bank of Lenore and it also had a barometer on it. And this would change colors as to whether it was going to rain or be dry or 
whatever. So uh, this is a pretty neat little item. Now, one that looks exactly like it, but this one is from the M.M. M. Courtney, uh, Courtney's Clothing Store. It actually says, established in 1872, Courtney's Correct Fashion in Apparel. And the phone number on this one is the 451-5211. So this thermometer is a little later on. Yes, the clothing, uh, Courtney Clothing Store was uh, well known in Lenore. In fact, the building's still standing uh, there, which is across the street from the city offices, uh, I believe. Uh, yes. At least that mm -hmm. block that's across the street from the city office on the corner there, I believe. I'm not sure what business is in there at the moment. Another early thermometer, and uh, the phone number is 170. Now this is Clay's Market. Uh, I neglected to bring the information as to where this was located in downtown Lenore, but I'm not sure of what street uh, it was on. But uh, a lot of times, like the Greer Funeral Home would throw, show Jesus or a mother holding a baby, and this one here is a mother holding a baby. And a lot of times they would do that to where that the people had a nice picture to look at they had something that would tell them the temperature, but they would have something that would also tell them about their business. Okay. So this was, you know, kind of had a threefold uh, thing to it. Uh, this little metal one here is from uh, the Caldwell Insulation Company. Uh, I've heard quite a bit about it. I've got uh, fans on this company, and I think I've got a key ring and a, a pin that they also made as advertisements. Uh, this number also was uh, 45171, and it is known as the Caldwell Insulation. As a matter of fact, I have a white one of these yellow ones. And uh, So uh, our next thermometer we'll look at, and a lot of people know this business. Uh, this, where it had two different pictures, had the thermometer, but uh, this was the Home Electric Company. It was on Harper Avenue. Uh, most people remember Jim Cole, right. uh, who was the manager or the, that run that place. I know my dad uh, bought several refrigerators or stoves or different things from the Home Electric. Uh, the Home Electric Company done a lot of different things. They had several buildings back there that they would uh, they sold TVs, they would repair TVs, they done electrical work uh, in a lot of homes. And so uh, they had a pretty broad range of what they'd done, not only selling appliances, but uh, they also done the work on them. You right. know, so they, mm -hmm. uh, if you bought an appliance, you could get it worked on there. And they were electrical contractors as well, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. The building is still standing. It's uh, across uh, Boundary Street, I guess it is, from uh, the Smithies building, from the side of Smithies, isn't that right? Isn't mm -hmm. that where it was located? Yeah. Now, here's one that a lot of businesses got together and they made up an advertisement to where uh, they put all the business, there's probably 10 or 12 businesses on here. Uh, the one at the top is the First Union National Bank. You also had a medical arts pharmacy. You had German uh, mobile homes, which also sold Chrysler, Plymouth, and Valiant cars. You had the Thrift Food Center. Uh, you had Lenore Funeral Home, Hodges Drive-In Cleaners. Right. Uh, that was in an old church down on West Avenue for many right, years. Right, I believe where the uh, police department is located the, now. Absolutely. Uh, you also had... Uh, W.G. Cannon Paint Company. Uh, you had Carolina Tire and Appliance, which would be on Harper Avenue, and I think Bruce Hayes owns that building now. Uh, it's across from the spa, so. Yeah, it's where the old Winn Dixie used to be, that right. parking lot right there. Uh, you had City Auto and Radiator Service, uh, and it also says that they worked on uh, Harley Davidson's there. Uh, 
you had L.M. DeMitt, uh, President and Treasurer, and you had uh, Joel DeMitt, who was Vice President of the Fidelity Insurance Company. I used to have insurance with those people. Uh, the Fidelity Building is still standing today, right. and it still looks as though it, you know, did many years ago. Right. That, that's a problem a lot of times. A lot of these buildings have changed in downtown Lenore. They've took these panels, plastic or glass or something, and put over a lot of this good decorative brickwork right. that was there at one time. You had Pennell and Hagler uh, Construction Company, and you had Baker Wheel Alignment Service. So here you have a, a, a bunch of... Uh, businesses that got together and made up a thermometer to where you could select whichever business you wanted to go to or all of them. I would say that is the late 1950s, Bruce. I remember having one of those thermometers at my house. I don't know what happened to it, but I remember that being um, um, at home. I'm sure my dad picked it up somewhere when he did business with one of those people. Well, uh, I think in, was it 50? I think it was 58 that they added the plaza to the numbers. Mm -hmm. So this would have been just right before that because all of these numbers are, uh, well, I'm sorry, they do have plans on Right. It. I don't have my reading glasses on today, folks. Uh, but every one of these numbers are plaza with the PL in front of it. Mm -hmm. Well, John, I've got the stuff, but you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a pretty early one. This is one that uh, sit on your table. It's in, uh, looks like a, uh, a ship's wheel. And it shows a ship in the picture of it right there. But uh, this is from uh, Lenore Roofing Company. And it does say Merry Christmas. And if John, if you would, look at the date on that. Uh, seasons greetings 1948 1948 so that's a that's a pretty early thermometer uh, Lenore roofing was uh, beside of city service cleaners on Harper Avenue okay and I believe there are two more that you haven't told us about you haven't mentioned the Gibbons electric and you haven't mentioned the one that I have in my hands here okay let's go with the Gibbons electric uh, as most of you know, this is Robert Gibbons, who was the mayor for many years, and uh, his sons have taken over this business. Uh, this one does have the PL on it in Plaza. Uh, this is the earliest one I have. They have, I think there's two or three of these different, and they're all a little bit different thermometers. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is Gibbons Electric, and it was out on Harper Avenue. Uh, they actually own three buildings there now. It's the corner of Harper and Broadway Street. So uh, They have changed their telephone number, Bruce, uh, because I had reason to call Mike this morning, and that's not the number I dialed to get him. So. <laughs> well, I guess as these businesses go along, they have to change to a certain extent. And what is, can you tell us about this one that says Harold F. Coffee? Yes, uh, there was a Harold Finley Coffee who had Coffee's furniture, Kent uh, Coffee, Kent coffee furniture. right. Uh, this was part of a desk set that he had on his desk uh, and uh, acquired this through a nice lady that finds me a lot of Lenore stuff and I'm really thankful to that lady. But this, when Kent Coffee shut down, the secretary of Harold Finley Coffee got this and several other items and had them in her house until she passed away and then her son let go of some of this stuff and this lady who goes to yard sales found this for me and brought it to me and okay. let me have it so but this is a a very prominent family in right. Lenore uh, known for businesses from back in the teens uh, what was the father's name Finley Coffee. Uh, Mr. Finley Coffee, I believe, yes. Yeah, and then this was one of his sons who was Harold, and the other one was Archie. Right, and also a daughter named Irene that was connected with the furniture business, and then another daughter named Ethel, I believe, who lived in Gastonia, and, uh, but was not connected with the business at all. And Bruce, I don't know whether you're aware or not, but I understand that uh, none of those children had heirs. 
Uh, so that family has died out since the death of all four of Mr. Finley Coffey's children. That there, there's not, none of his posterity still around. Yeah, uh, that, that's a shame too that a family just disappears. You know? Right. And that's one of the reasons for saving some of this stuff. You know, there, there's no more Coffey family. So if we don't save part of this history, then this family could just go and go away and there would be no more existence maybe, of them. Maybe we better clarify that a little bit. There's no more of that particular branch of the coffee okay. family. There's still plenty of coffees around. <laughs> right. The name, I don't think any danger of the name dying, but, uh, Not in but that, County. But that uh, particular family uh, has uh, left us, all of us. Okay. Bruce, this is an interesting item. Uh, in advertising, they gave you something that served two purposes. Looks like both a thermometer and a pen from City Flower and Feed. Yeah, this, this was a real neat item. Uh, it, it'll stand up on your desk. And uh, like John said, it, it does have a pen you can write with it. And it has a thermometer in it that uh, tells you what the temperature is. And uh, this is City Flower and Feed. It was in business for a lot of years at the bottom of Vance Street. And uh, it was Lenore, North Carolina. Has their phone number on it. And on the bottom, it also says that hot or cold, we're here to serve you. So uh, was it the McGimsey family that owned that for years? I think you're right, but now don't... Don't use me as an authority uh, on that one. Uh, but you'll also notice that there the number is 754 prefix. Uh, so that's going to date that a little bit as a later item than some of the others mm -hmm. that we've had. Absolutely. Okay, we also mentioned uh, the coffee family a little bit earlier, and you have something uh, about Kent Coffee bedroom furniture. Uh, what is this item, and where did you get in? Uh, I cannot remember where I got that. Uh, I got it out of a house on West Avenue. Uh, can't recall the man's name, but he worked at Kent Coffee's for several years. And as a matter of fact, I got an original uh, photograph of Finley Coffee. That that photograph you have it in the museum up there also. Right. And uh, this was just a little thing that would sit up and it would advertise the Kent Coffee uh, bedroom furniture. And that's basically what that furniture company was about, was they done a lot of bedroom furniture. I came across this catalog, and uh, this is the Kent Coffee Manufacturing Company, Lenore, North Carolina. This catalog is dated uh, 1922, and it shows a lot of dressers, chests, uh, beds, and uh, all the furniture that you had in uh, the line of furniture that they put out. They also done some uh, dining room furniture, which was uh, sideboards and different things. And in the back of this catalog, it gives the prices. And I don't know if he'll, he'll be able to get this later on, but these prices are in 1922 was uh, real, real, cheap according to today's standards. And wholesale prices too, I'm sure. Uh, probably wholesale. Uh, uh, give us some examples. What were some of the costs? Okay. Uh, a combination dresser and washstand was $11.25. And that was out of oak. Okay. Uh, you had a walnut finish with gum wood but it, uh, this, was also, this was a dresser, and it was $17.59. Uh, they do have uh, other dressers. Uh, Square Upright is what they called it. It was $11.50, and they ranged and went up to the highest one was $23 for a dresser in those days. So you could just about put a whole bedroom suit together for about $65, 70 and it all be out of good oak lumber, and uh, some pieces still last today from this furniture stuff. Right, probably handmade and uh, a very sturdy type of, uh, of furniture. 
I suppose, though, in the 1920s that that $65 was a fortune to, to a lot of people. Absolutely. Uh, I do have some uh, cards from uh, people that used to pay their bill at, at Old Pete Lutes mm -hmm. and, uh, back in the 30s, and they'd buy a piece of furniture, and they were paying 25 cents a week right. on this piece of furniture that only cost, you know, like maybe six, seven, eight dollars but uh, they were paying 25 cents a week. Well, I remember my dad telling when he uh, was working, uh, when Social Security came in in 1937, he was working in the furniture factory for $12 a week, and they would take one cent out of each dollar for Social Security, so his take-home pay was eleven eighty-eight dollars uh, in, the, in the late 1930s. So uh, I suppose he would have been one of those who had had to pay that 25 cents a week on that furniture or two. <laughs> Bruce, it looks like that fans were a popular form of advertisement for some companies, and you have two or three fans here. This is one from this Compliments of Lenore Drugstore, and Earl H. Tate's name is on there, and of course he was associated with that store for many years and was also a mayor of Lenore for many years. Uh, but the picture on the front is interesting too. It says, four generation of Putnam Good uh, w goodwill from the president and founder, Ian Munro, to great-granddaughter, Diane. Now, we don't know when this uh, fan was made, uh, but judging from the style of clothing of the little girl, I would say maybe the 20s, 30s, maybe uh, at, the, at the very latest. Uh, and then uh, Turner Furniture Company fan is a little bit unique in shape. And I've never heard of Turner Furniture Company. Tell me what you can about it. Well, the only thing I realize or know is that uh, it was where Lindsay Furniture Company wound up on South Mulberry Street. There's a church, a Baptist church in that building right, right now. Trinity Baptist, I Trinity believe. Trinity Baptist, and they're in that building. And uh, But Turner Furniture Company started out in there, and their address was 107 South Mulberry Street. It says, let us make your home your house a home. Okay. And then the third one we have is Tipton Funeral Home. Now, I have heard of Tipton, so tell me what you can about it. Well, Tipton Funeral Home started out on West Avenue on the left-hand side just below the police department in a building. It was a store building. And, and matter of fact, there was a shoe store. The Lenore Shoe Shop was beside of that building. And they started out in there. Well, then, because of the way they done things, they moved across the street into the house where actually Greer Funeral Home started. Uh, matter of fact, Greer Funeral Home took this business over. Now, this is the story that I have from several older people in this town, was that uh, Tipton's Funeral Home, they sold a bunch of burial insurance and got a bunch of money. And then, for some reason or another, they wanted to keep the money or they didn't have the money, and they had to leave town. So that's when uh, Greer Funeral Home took that over, and it became Greer Funeral Home instead of Tipton's. One of the interesting things on this says that uh, funerals furnished complete, including hearse and service, $50, $65, and $75. I wonder what the difference was between the $50 funeral and the $75 funeral. Well, I do know that, uh, and, and we'll go ahead and get into that, uh, Lenore Hardware Company, which was uptown where the, uh, the antique store is now, it was known as the Lenore Hardware and Furniture Company. Uh, but they also had furniture, rugs, coffins, caskets, paints, varnishes, hardware. They sold uh, sawmill hard supply, hardware supplies, uh, milling supplies. They sold belts. But one thing I do know that they put the word coffin in caskets, okay? The coffins was a pine box. Mm -hmm. And the casket was maybe a fancier one with it lined. Okay. So that was the difference. Might have been the difference in the price of this fifty and seventy-five dollar one. That the fifty might have been a coffin, and the seventy-five dollar might have been a casket. Yes, I know that hardware stores did sell coffins and caskets often when the body was prepared in the home when there was no funeral director 
uh, required back in, in the old days. You know, on the back of this uh, fan, Bruce, is uh, something that's quite interesting that may tie in with uh, Lenore history also. This is the uh, well-known uh, Rock of Ages painting. And the story is that it was painted by uh, Reverend Erdl, who was the minister at the Episcopal Church here in Lenore uh, back sometime in the 1800s. And I understand that the picture was never copyrighted, so therefore it's been plagiarized many, many times uh, and used for, for many, many uh, things. Uh, the Erdl family did not get any, other, any royalty or any uh, copyright on it. Uh, this says Rock of Ages, George Hacker. So I don't know whether Mr. Hacker has claimed this is his own or whether he's done a variation on the painting uh, or what. Uh, but the Rock of Ages painting was, uh, is a part of uh, Lenore and Caldwell County history as well also. Okay, Bruce, in this last few minutes that we have left, how about telling us about these uh, four rulers that you have here? Well, one thing I'd like to say that a lot of these businesses did put out yardsticks and rulers. There was a yardstick on Lenore Hardware uh, I have them on Kent Coffee, McGowan Hardware, uh, you know, and all of those places put these out. This is probably one of the earliest rulers that I have, and uh, it's advertising Tums for the Tummy. Huh. And uh, this was a little ruler that was, and you can just barely make out who it was, what it, but it was Blue's Drugstore. And it actually had a place on the back that you could write your name and your address. And, uh, but it, it was an advertisement of things that, that he sold. Uh, probably the next ruler would have been Lenore Stationery Company. Uh, now the phone was 192 and you know they have a lot of different things that they show on this thing that actually what they sold desk, uh, they sold books, dictionaries, uh, stationary equipment, and I like the little picture of the phone right beside of it. It's one of the old candlestick phones that they had back in the 30s and the 40s. And uh, the phone number was 192, and it was Lenore, North Carolina. You know. Okay, where was the Lenore Stationery Store located, Bruce? Uh, actually, it was located right across the street from where we're sitting. It's on a corner uh, that is basically still in existence. I don't know that it's called that now. Doug Pegram owns that business. I believe it's called Anything Office. Anything Office. But that's where this was located, uh, phone number of 192. And uh, they made rubber stamps also in there. And I do have a lot of rubber stamps from some of the furniture factories around where they would stamp different finishes or the furniture on labels and things. So they've done a lot of different things. Now, this next one, which is Lenore Office Equipment. Uh, now, they sold paper and pencils and pens. And it says they were located on 105 West Harper Avenue, and their phone number was Plaza 47341. We don't know exactly where this was located, what building it was in. So this might be a good opportunity that... Uh, if you know where this was at, call me and let me know so I can put it into my notes of uh, where this place was located. Why don't you go ahead and give us that number again, Bruce, if they want to call you about that or anything. Okay, it's 754-7330. Okay, now tell us about the Crest Family Center, Riddler, that you have there. Uh, the Crest Family Center was located in the Crossroads Shopping Center down there where Sears was and I think there's a auto parts. They've, they've divided this building up into like three different buildings now. Uh, but this was a huge department store that was in there. Yes. And uh, they also made this ruler, but they also made a yardstick. So uh, I've got both of these, the yardstick and the ruler. So, uh, and their number was 7581134. Bruce, this is just a small amount of the items that you have. You have had some of them on display up at the Caldwell Heritage Museum, I believe back in the uh, year 2001. Uh, perhaps we can get uh, them back again at some point in the future. Uh, and speaking of the museum, we would love to have you come visit us. We have lots of items there that uh, might be of interest to those of you who are interested in Caldwell County history. 
Uh, we are located at 112 Vaden Street, just behind the Davenport School. We're open from 10 o'clock a.m. until 4.30 p.m. Tuesday through Friday, 10 o'clock a.m. to 3 uh, p.m. on Saturdays. There are two videos of Bruce Craig's entire collection on Bill Tate's YouTube channel. Also, there is the history of Lenore Hardware and Furniture Company. Over 100 history videos of Lenore and Caldwell County, North Carolina.